So first we have Carrick Ashley, who's the Interim Deputy Superintendent, District School and Innovation Branch of the California Department of Education, where he oversees the divisions that administer assessment and accountability, Title I, Charter Schools, and Data Management. We have Janelle Kubinick, who's the Director of the Comprehensive School Assistance Program at WestEd, where she also directs the California Comprehensive Center, a federally funded center charged with building the capacity of California to implement the Elementary Secondary Education Act. Um, and then next we have Rick Miller, who's the Executive Director of the CORE Districts. I'll let him tell you which ones they are if you don't already know. Um, prior to joining CORE, uh, Miller was the Deputy State Superintendent for P16 Policy and Information at the California Department of Education. So you each have about seven minutes. I'll try and politely cut you off when you've gone over. Um, and then we'll open it up. All right. Uh, Eric, would you like to start? Sure. <clears throat> So I, I do have to correct one thing that, that David said this morning, uh, this afternoon. Um, I, actually, I actually have a lifetime teaching credential that I got in 1979. So I think they were just considering it when they saw David go through the program. And I think that cinched it when I went through the program. So um, yeah, so there's some things um, that I think were, very beneficial, and uh, as we move the conversation forward, one of them has to do with this idea of a single number versus multiple measures. And I just want to remind folks, before my time working in this topic, uh, but when we created the API back in 1999, it, it served a specific purpose. And for those of you who weren't around at the time, we had a governor's awards program, and we had an intermediate, Inter immediate intervention underperforming schools program. So there was a very real need to be able to identify and rank all of these schools. And so in doing so, it was a process to create a single number that would represent a school and then allow for that to rank those schools in order to identify those who would either be awarded or be provided some intervention. So there were some good reasons to, to develop a system at that time that served that purpose. Now I think we're in a different time and we can talk about a different purpose. Um, I, I think most people realize that a single number is not reflective of, of a school's performance, um, that um, it's not difficult for parents to understand more than one number. Yes, one number is easy, um, but uh, th that doesn't mean we, sh we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't underestimate what parents are able to do in terms of interpreting what schools uh, are doing and how successful schools are. In fact, when a child's report card comes home every quarter, it doesn't have one grade on it. It's got eight, nine, ten grades on it. Parents don't seem to have a problem interpreting what that grade or that report card means. So having more than one number is not going to confuse uh, parents or the general public. Now, having one number makes it very simple to do certain things, and sometimes I think we edu in education get ourselves into trouble when we take something that's difficult and try to make it very simple. And one number is simple, and it's simple for uh, the legislature to then, to then identify programs and use that single number for something. Um, and it's simple for people to talk about it, realtors, for example. Um, but, but that doesn't make it the best way of going about it. So I do think moving in the direction of multiple measures it would be very helpful. Um, um, the, the idea of a continuous improvement system uh, should happen at all levels, starting, I think, starting with um, the teacher, right? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll put in a plug right now for the investment that the state has made in smarter balance ass assessments, not just at the summative level, but the state's made an investment in, in some formative tools that we refer to as the digital library and to interim assessments uh, that'll be released soon for uh, teachers and educators to use. So again, this idea of even at the classroom level of continuous improvement working with students, we need to translate that into a system at the school level and then at the district level, which is what we're attempting to do as a state um, with the local control uh, accountability plan. I will say this idea of state and local um, partnership is a good one. Um, I think we need to determine what roles each of them play and where, what are they best positioned to do. There are certain things that the state is in a good position to do. Believe it or not, there is some value uh, added uh, at, 
at the state level. Um, one of the things is to provide some, some policy direction um, and some leadership of, of where people want, where, where we think um, schools and districts ought to go. Obviously, providing resources to schools and districts um, is a good role for the state uh, to play. I think the state can, can disseminate information in a single place, like a, like, a, like a CDE website in which reports can be looked up and, and you can compare district to district. I think the state is in a good position to uh, do a single calculation with a single data collection that would allow, again, people in the public to compare schools and districts if that's something that they want to do. The state is not in a good position to make immediate changes in schools and districts. Right, so so the, the, the local control accountability uh, plan allows the locals to make sense of state data and as, and as David was referring to, telling the local story. So state data only takes you so far without knowing what the local story is of what's going on in a local school district. And that's why local data is important. That's why interpreting the data locally is important, setting goals and, and whether what you're going to do about those goals uh, to make improvements is, again, a local decision. And so there are some things that the state's well positioned to do and there are some things that locally um, districts are better positioned to do. So I'll just, I'll, I'll just say one last, one last thing or maybe another 20 minutes, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I, just in terms of data um, out there for, for schools and districts um, and, and the general public, um, I think the, this idea of, of dashboards, which has been used um, not this morning by David, but it is a term that gets used um, quite frequently when we talk about data, and there are good things about this idea of dashboards one, it's a good thing to talk about multiple measures and different ways of measuring what a school is doing. Um, but two, at the local level, if you have local dashboards, you can make those continuous improvement changes on a regular basis, continuous basis. The problem with the state level data is we produce most of it one time a year. You know, and having, having a speedometer or a gas meter with data from one day out of the year is not very helpful if you're actually in a car. Um, it's good for providing overall direction for the year, but it's not good for making immediate decisions on what happens in schools or for students. And so uh, I think there's some investment has to happen at the local level for this idea of dashboards to really be effective more than providing a general policy um, and goal setting direction at the district level. Um, because if, if a student is being chronically absent, uh, there's no time to send data to the state for us to turn around, give it back to you, and then for the, for them for the school to intervene. It, does, it just doesn't work that way, right? So, the, so those dashboards uh, may take an investment at the local level in order to make immediate impact. And then the last, we're going to have to, with the state and, and local partnership, that state needs to include our legislature because we really need to talk about the planning processes that we've put in place, including the single plan for student achievement, uh, the school accountability report card, the SARC. These are things that should reflect the state's priorities, and currently they don't, because they're from, um, they're from the, uh, our past, if you will. Like the API in 1999, uh, single plan for student achievement, SARC, these are things that were created um, in the past under a different environment, and if we want schools and districts to be single-minded about the goals that they have, we need to make sure that those are aligned moving forward with what the state priorities are. So I'll stop talking. Okay. So let me ex um, say first, I appreciate David's comments and, and providing us some context. And uh, I think it is validating to know why we may feel so exhausted here in California. Um, so it's good to actually have some, some sense of context. I mean, I, I think if you look at the timelines um, from the past, I think one of our challenges is how do we uh, create a process right now that leads to not those same timelines with a year and then something different and then something different. And I do think some of this has, has, is specific to the moment. Um, and so a lot of what David brought up in terms of 
how things, we have this moment where things are potentially connecting and we can build coherence, were not the case when you go back to the last round of assessments or you go back to the last round when we did funding. Um, those, those timelines were completely different. So I would say this is like the first moment, and when you say this is our chance in this generation to do this kind of work, I'd say the conditions have been set forth by our legislature for that to be happen, for that to happen, uh, in that we have funding reform happening at the same time as revising standards as we're introducing new assessments and then creating an accountability system. So, you know, my perspective from a policy and implementation standpoint is if we blow it now, we're not going to have the same kind of opportunity, at least not when it comes to the alignment of policy. Um, and I do think that the comments also highlighted we're a system in transition. And it's not just one part, it's the whole system. Yet the work of education persists. So one of the, the challenges that we face in transitions is how do you invent what will happen next while you're still living what's going on now? And I think some of the struggles that we see in that challenge of the theory of action in making those shifts from a very largely practical compliance operation, operating uh, mode to one where we can talk about performance is the reality of day-to-day -day activities that need to happen in terms of you know, taking attendance before we think about chronic attendance and absenteeism and how it might relate to accountability to administering tests. And you know, while we have the new test, we're still looking at old scores and, and thinking about the transition to teaching. So all of this is being juggled in a very practical way, which I think we have to also at times remember the perspective, which is the here and now is not always what it will be when we get to through this transition. Um, and so trying to imagine the system and coming up with some vision to think about how those pieces fit, I think at this moment are absolutely critical. Um, but I do think that it's easy for us to look at what we have today as what we, you know, as a, as a starting point and, and really in some ways clouding the perspective that we're going to have of what the system can be. Um, I think about it as memory foam. Our memory foam is, is just what happened today and, and I think this, it's, it's helpful to think about the structure between state accountability and local accountability and I would actually add to that state largely pronounced with federal accountability to our system. And that's what people see. So when you go to a school district and you talk about what's accountability, it's largely synonymous with AYP. Somewhat helpful, you know, to, and it comes up with references around the API. But we get a lot of the sanctions have emerged and that which has been, you know, mindful in a compliance orientation has been around federal accountability. So I think some of what is part of this transition is the mindset around what do we mean when we say accountability. So the historical view of having gone from local accountability systems largely to an emerging state to a ever-present today federal sense of accountability. How do we start to remember and remind ourselves of what really does it look like when we talk about local accountability? Right now we say that, but we still see the constructs of what is largely a federal or a state accountability system. So, you know, I think it's an interesting moment as we think about not only how do we draw distinctions between state and federal and local accountability, but how do we want to articulate the connections between those? So is it that we have common data elements or is it complementary data elements as we look at the system that's emerging? And then how do we build some appreciation or trust in that system at a local level, at a local level that's been largely accustomed to worrying about sanctions when they hear the word accountability? And and so I do think this is a, 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 a something that, to think about in a very practical way as, as we work to build this um, hopefully you know, logical and productive system. So I'll build on something Carrick also said, which is the, the once a year measure piece. So the other piece that we're very accustomed to in accountability is when that word comes up, we think we're gonna have a report. We're gonna have a report that tells us you know, where we are with the academic performance index. We're gonna have a report that tells us um, how we are with our AYP or numbers of schools that are in PI or whether our district's in program improvement. And we're not very accustomed to what does it look like when the state says accountability, how that can be formative. And I think this is something that as we're looking at the system emerging, one of the opportunities um, as we look at the LCFF element of accountability, which is um, right now um, being worked on through the evaluation rubrics, how can we look at evaluation rubrics as potentially a formative tool in a process that's gonna help move us past what has largely been summative results through having a score or having a mark that, that we meet or we don't. 
Um, and I think that's a lot of the public discourse right now is how do we envision such a system? How do we make that, if we're going to be formative, useful to state purposes, useful to local purposes, so that we end up with a productive element that must complement that which is going to emerge as a state accountability system. And so this brings up um, the point of timing. I think we, we look at where we are today and this transition piece is um, we're going to, as a state, have evaluation rubrics that are developed related to LCFF because there's a deadline in law and it says October 2015. And we will lag in terms of coming up with uh, the state system that's adopted. So one of the, the I think, uh, practical issues as we work on this emerging policy area is how do we articulate what those connections will be when we have to put some marks down and I'd hope also suggest some connections that will emerge through cycles of change um, in that we shouldn't expect that we're going to have the perfect system come out of the gate, but we're going to hopefully have a good system with a better process for maintaining some of those connections as we go on. Um, and you know, I think that's something that we just have to keep in mind as we move ahead, which is we're building a system. And, and it's one that has to exist within an existing operating environment, one that is taking us a new direction with vision. And, and I think one that if you look at some of our timelines, we're going to have to communicate well and also think ahead to what that system or that cycle of improvement will be if we're truly committed to continuous improvement, not just in measures, but also in the process of developing a system. So, um, so I think it's, it's either very uh, validating to think about what David said, or it's just actually incredibly validating of the daunting challenge we have. Um, and, and I think uh, that if we can think in the continuous improvement frame, we give ourselves some space to be innovative, uh, to start making those shifts from compliance performance. Um, but that is not necessarily a space that we've occupied in our policy arena, even as much as in our operating arena. And I'm Rick Miller uh, with the uh, core districts. Make sure I get to the right place. Great. So I want to talk to you. I would. Uh, I appreciate the conversation, the way David laid it out, and, and Janelle and Carrick's response. I think what I what I'm going to present today. I would argue what I'm present today is an example of what one might look like. This is an accountability model the core district's been working on for several years, and I think it's not the answer, but it could be a, an example of what we how we could uh, look at these models. Uh, the core districts, if you're not familiar, are ten districts across the state of California, mostly large districts representing. Um, over a million students. So six of the kids in California are represented in the core districts and we're pretty much up and down the state. Uh, and we have, as many of you know, a waiver from the federal government around AYP. So for us, we have a different AYP than every other district in California. And that's sort of what we're laying out, uh, what we out for you today. So we start with this notion uh, that we've talked about is that we also believe deeply in multiple measures. And we believe deeply that you need to look at beyond just test scores, decide what it is that makes a good, a good school and makes you college career ready. And when we started to design our system, the first thing we did was we actually asked all of our districts to send us their dashboard, their board adopted dashboard. The theory being we had AYP, we had API, but those were not the things that local boards actually cared about and paid a lot of attention to. And it was this disconnect between what you're held accountable for and what you knew mattered. And when we actually did, when we pulled these together, what you'll see in our, uh, our accountability model, 90% was there. These are the measures that local districts felt mattered to them and felt if they were doing these right, they were on the track to getting college and career-ready graduates. And so that's what we start with. And we break that into two domains, an academic domain and a culture, climate, and social-emotional domain. And you can see the measures we have up there. Uh, it's important as you look at the academic that we look at both achievement and growth across every measure. I'll talk a little more about that in a second. We look at grad rates and then we look at persistence rates between uh, middle school and high school. We've added that because we were particularly concerned about the number of students we lose in that transition. So we wanted to put it in a way to hold ourselves accountable. That was the academic side. And then on the social emotional uh, um, culture climate side, we look at chronic absenteeism, uh, student and staff culture climate surveys uh, that actually, you know, we're working with West Ed and CDE on the Healthy Kids surveys driving a lot of that work. But the notion being, we think part of accountability is asking parents, asking teachers, and asking students what they think of their school. And that should be part of what we hold ourselves accountable for. Um, suspension expulsion rates specifically around the issue of disproportionality. Um, social emotional skills, uh, non or metacognitive skills, David, thank you. Uh, so we are, uh, the only ones the model was, these actually are the issues, they, they, they are the right drivers for reform, they are the things you ought to be paying attention to. So rather than these are the things we're going to use to hammer our schools, these are things that we say if you're, you ought to be given credit for paying attention to these measures. And these notion of non-cognitive growth mindset, self-reliance, 
uh, self-efficacy, there's good reason to believe they matter a lot, and so we're putting it in our model because we, we, we want to put a marker to say we want to pay attention to these issues. We want, we want to give teachers the, the, the ability locally to have the, have, have the ability to do that. Uh, redesignation rates of English language learners, I'll talk about that in a second too, and then finally special ed in terms of disproportionality. And just to be clear, uh, uh, underneath, underneath each one of them, we're gonna be looking at all subgroups. So we're really hyper-focusing on achievement gaps and saying there's no way under our model you'll be successful unless you're closing gaps. Um, and to go even a step further, although it wasn't required, um, in many schools under AYP and AAPI in some instance, it's, a, it's an end size of 100 for, for a subgroup. Ours has actually dropped by, uh, by choice down to 20. And there are tens of thousands of more students uh, of color and poverty that were not included in an accountability model under a, as a subgroup that will be now under our model. So again, we actually, but I think the key the point that we try to make here is when it's driven not by punitive, but driven by the things that we collectively think we want to pay attention and we know matter, you can make much more bold decisions and go much farther, I think, than you can uh, when you look at it from a different angle. And this ultimately uh, is the model done by percentages. And I, and I point this out just to sort of say that we've gone through the thing of actually weighting them, because I do think it's important how they weight and how they come uh, t t together. So David talked about, and I couldn't agree more, this idea of you're going to have both measures, and you may have some state says certain things and local says certain things. The, the critical thing is that if you think about it, the state has some things they care about and says you need to do this, and then locals, you can do whatever you want. That's API. That's AYP. That's what we have today. The critical thing is if you, you have to allow a space, if you say that as a state government, to allow you actually to weight those measures in your ultimate accountability model that you put forward. And so it's just a distinction I really wanted to hammer out that we, we need to have that part of it so we're really truly holding ourselves accountable uh, for the same thing. So I just want to give you an example of how we're using this local data. And I should add, too, that we have, we've uh, done a uh, partnership with Stanford University at the Gardner Center. And we, are, we have a sort of a shared data system between our 10, 10 districts. So we have um, what we would argue a continuous learning system, system with millions of records in them to better understand how we're working across our systems. And not surprisingly, when we ran the thing, our results show that we have great disproportionality in terms of chronic absenteeism and in terms of um, suspension. You see we're trending in the exact right direction of suspension, which Superintendent Torkson released the, uh, announced the other day. And I would add that if you look at it, uh, the core districts are a, um, a, a disproportionate percentage of the driving of that decrease in the number of suspension expulsions. And I would argue because we specifically called it out, we've been holding ourselves accountable for it. Uh, and then chronic absence. But as a result of that, then if you look and you, we do the work, we, saw, we found that we have middle schools with relatively high chronic absence suspension rates, and it, it pulls them out, and it pulls the outliers out, and this is sort of the continuous aspect. So the reason we're doing this is not as a punishment, but to learn and find where we need help. And when we look across all of our districts, we find outliers both good and bad, right? And so this is an area where you're having uh, schools who are really high both chronic absence and suspensions, significantly higher than, than everyone else. And it causes us to go there and sort of say, what's going on here and what work do we need to do? But beyond just sort of saying what's going on here, we also will take a look and say, and I should say, i just showing you here what this is. Even in schools with comparably large African-American populations, you have large disparities. So e even at the, at the low subgroup level, there's places that we need to pay attention. There's warning we need to ha that we have. And we can find with, with similar demographics, schools doing better, and we need to learn why. So in this thing, if you look at the same scatter plot, you see schools in the bottom, bottom low are uh, showing improvement in both indicators. And the other side, these schools are really not doing well in both indicators. So what we're doing, though, is we're going, we're using this, we're finding this, and then we're actually pairing these schools together. We're getting them to talk together, work together, and learn from each other. Our entire theory of action is about this ultimately is about building capacity. So it's not about having someone come in and fix the system, but it's actually saying the expertise lies within the system, and we need to have systems that allow us to work together and, and improve as a system. And so we, we think we actually have examples of schools getting together now and having significant results uh, along the way. So this is ultimately an example of what we're trying to build rather than simply an accountability model that hammers, but a way to actually improve uh, as a system. Two examples, and then I just, and I'll include, but I also want to talk about how we come up with these metrics. So it can be really, Difficult and hard work, but I think you learn important things along the way. So one thing we talked about was we wanted to have a persistence rate, the number of kids uh, going on from eighth grade to high school. 
So what we originally said we're going to do is we're going to look at the number of kids who leave eighth grade and the number of kids who are still enrolled in 10th grade, and that was going to be our persistence rate. But when we actually ran the numbers, what we found is there's a significant number of students who are still enrolled in 10th grade, but they're so credit deficient they have no chance of graduating. So it wasn't actually giving us the results we want. So we went back and we continued to crunch the data and looked at it. What we found was if you have an eight, in eighth grade, you have a 2.5 GPA or higher, you have 90% or better attendance rate, uh, no Ds or Fs, and you have no suspensions, you are almost assured, like, with a 98% chance, you're going to graduate. So we took that and we, and we changed our metric. And so the point is that we're trying to constantly change and learn from our own data as we build these metrics. But also, I would say the core superintendents felt uncomfortable with that because ultimately that says you're going to graduate, but it in no way says that you're going to be college and career ready. So what we found was actually if you, if you up it and you look at a higher GPA, a 3.0, then you have a better likelihood based on our data that you're going to be a college and career, or you're actually going to go on to higher education. And so we're not only going to, do, we're not only going to have the persistence rate, but we're going to report the higher college and career readiness indicator so all of our schools, parents, and teachers know where they are um, on all these metrics. And the final one I'll give just as an example is uh, EL reclassification. So we, we originally wanted to do reclassification. We looked at the, uh, as we came up with these metrics, we looked at the data and we was clear to us was within five years, the research is pretty clear, you should reclassify a student within five years in a US school. What the data is much less clear on is it, whether it should be the first year or the fourth year. And that really depends on the child and the situation. And what we didn't want to do is we, want, we originally we were going to say every, every student in t after five years in our schools, how many kids have you reclassified? And what, would mean, what that would mean is if you reclassified in the second or third year, you actually would get no credit. But the point was we didn't want to disincentivize you and ask you to go earlier if that wasn't what was best for the child. But ultimately, that was very concerning for the, for the uh, schools because they thought we're getting no credit for moving kids forward. So what we ultimately came to is this notion of we're actually going to look at the number of students reclassified as a numerator and the denominator over the number of kids who have been in our system for six or more, five or more years and have not reclassified. And th the reason I bring this up is I think these are just interesting examples along the way as you sort of play these out. It allows you to be much more flexible than sort of a rigid system that's set in stone, that's set in the Constitution or statute that you can't change and move along the way. And I think having this flexibility to learn from ourselves, to learn from the data as we begin to implement, is a critical part of whatever we build. And I'll, I'll end by simply saying that I think this notion is exactly right. I can't say strong enough. I don't think this is the right answer for every school. But I think, but I think it's a start. And we ought to make sure whatever the state does it allows sort of this local flexibility. So I envision a time where you absolutely could have multiple choices of what your accountability model is. If, you're, if you like the core model, you take that. If you like the API as it is, you take that. If you like the LCAPs in some sense, you take that. If you have a link learning model, you look at that. And the state board, I would argue, should be in the role of deciding which ones truly are rigorous and ensure that kids are college and career ready and that they've closed gaps along the way. And if you can convince the state board you've done that, I think the state board would, I would argue, should adopt. And then once, it, once an accountability model is adopted, any district in the state that wanted to opt into that accountability model could make that choice. But it would cause robust and positive conversations at state board, at local boards, as they decide what makes sense for us to hold ourselves accountable to. Yes, please. I had a question from the original speaker who was Well, it's a kind of, that's the kind of thing where you do have to triangulate. You can, some of it can be self-reported. Some of it can be measures like attendance. Some of it can be uh, information from teachers. But you don't need the same information about all students. And I think the last uh, presentation made that really clear. Is if you, it's a kind of thing where if you flag someone as potentially having a problem, then you collect more information about their engagement in more depth. Would be kind of a, more of a tiered system where you can efficiently and effectively uh, use data as opposed to kind of what we tend to do now, which is to get all this information, then we, then we throw most of it away and we don't use it. So it requires a little more sophistication, but the beauty is uh, we have systems, the data systems we're able to come up with now can begin to uh, help us make intelligent decisions about students in much the same way that you were sorting through and figuring out who were your high risk and low risk. Right. You, you can do that now and then focus your attention and energy, but you need enough measures to be able to you know, filter appropriately. So that that's... And, and you see, this is still all low stakes. You're not going to punish the student as a result of them being honest about their responses or the teacher being honest about the response about a student. 
I, I would also say we, we, we're doing a, um, so as an example of that, sort of this notion of metacognitive skills or social emotional skills. So uh, I'll take one growth mindset, which Carol Dweck's done a lot of work around. It's this notion of whether or not you actually have a belief that you can be successful. Or uh, another way to look at it that I like is the notion of if I do my homework, I actually believe that will make me get better in school. That I'll do better on the TED, I'll do better, and I'll understand the material. And for a lot of kids, they just don't have that belief set. They don't believe if they do the homework, it's gonna matter. And so there is, Carol's also done work to show that you can teach that. You can actually help kids get better. So we are doing, we're about to do in a, in a, in a few weeks, um, the largest uh, survey of this kind of skill set uh, ever done in, in the world, actually. Um, and so to better understand where students are on that and then help provide um, tools to assist in the classroom to sort of improve on that. So it's the very beginning of it. We're, we're far from there, but we've, you know, in our pilot last year, we, we did enough to actually, that Harvard did research around it and felt that it was a valid and reliable measure of a way to go. Ultimately, we'd like to see performance uh, tasks as a way to, to judge this, but there is beginning understanding of how to, how, how, how to, how to understand this, and we're starting that. I just, I just want to, you know, piggyback on that, the last point you made about performance tasks. When you're looking at student engagement and learning, if every single task they have to complete is something they can do in 20 minutes in the classroom, you're not going to get much of a measure of engagement because people are just, the students are just kind of showing up and doing what they're told. If a performance task requires more engagement and the student doesn't complete the task, there's a couple possible reasons why. I mean, one reason is it was just too difficult for them, but another reason is they simply didn't care. And particularly if you have a task that has uh, multiple components to it and a student never gets beyond the first one, and the first one's not that difficult, that's a potential indicator, once again, of lack of engagement. So you can get information from academic tasks that are, that are not, infer well, they're inferential, but they're, they're not judgmental. They're descriptive of a behavior. And, and, and those are the kind of things where, I, when, you, when you mentioned performance tasks, that got me thinking about that, is yeah. that that's an important amount, uh, source of information that we don't have right now when everything we do uh, is so, you know, so compartmentalized and, and uh, simplistic for students to I'll ask a question while people are warming up. Um, so, uh, Ricky, at the end, we're starting to, to get here and, um, and uh, about the role of the state. And I think, Eric, you kind of mentioned the limitations of the role of the state. And Janelle, you referenced it too. And I guess I just want to push you all a little bit further and careful that you have the last word on this. But on what, what, is, um, what in this system would be the right role or how can we start thinking about the role of the state? So I think the first part of this is acknowledging we have a state-funded education system. And, and I think that that is, we talk a lot about, well, we're local, and I think that's where boards function, but the reality is every dollar, property tax dollar, flows through the state, gets redistributed out even under LCFF to our school system. So part of this is, let's just acknowledge that, right? The state plays a very prominent role in the manner in which funds are distributed to ensure equity, to provide support in targeted ways to needs. Now, to take that into the accountability frame, I do think that there does, the state sets expectations. You see that in the state priorities. You see that, um, you know, where it's, here's what matters. We see that in state standards. So that's another form of expectation. So the question on accountability is, what then does that look like if you start to put those pieces together and say, we actually have a framework um, and how far do you go with still honoring what we would imagine, what we want to see as that local piece to support innovation and to um, take on that sense of responsibility. So I, I think that we have the outlines of what the state does well, which is create some standard expectations, create some roadmaps. I mean, we have not only do we have standards, but we have curriculum frameworks that emerge related to that in terms of expectations for instruction. So how do you then still allow for that local choices around what does it mean to analyze our data and innovate and think about what students need and be responsive to need but within some broad strokes of when we set standards, we have an expectation that students are going to be college and career ready and have options and opportunities. So, you know, I, I think in terms of accountability, is it, it's not, it goes beyond the state provided data. And, and I do think though that the state can create facilitative structures to see this local piece emerge. I, actually, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. And, and I would, um, but I would, I would go on, I would say, so. The most critical thing the state can do and does extremely well is set standards and then give an assessment tool to allow us to judge whether or not we're meeting those standards. Both of those are critical and need to be maintained. Um, although, obviously, the assessment can get better, and I think we're doing great strides to get better. Um, 
But where it falls apart then is when, uh, when you're not being successful and what happens as a result. And I think the state has been far too engaged in the intervention process in, in terms of dictating the intervention process. I mean, even if you look at 466, uh, the professional development dollars, which was a good uh, use of money, when the state sort of says, this is how you must do it, 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 that's probably one of the best problems that I can point to, and yet it still was not ultimately, I think, as effective as it could have been by dictating how, uh, how, how we ought to do things at the local level. And I would just argue it's not the expertise of the state. But I would go back to my argument. I believe the expertise does exist. The key is the state has to sort of remove itself from being a technical service provider, as does, frankly, the CD has to remove itself from sort of viewing itself that way, but more about someone who, where I think the state has an important role to play, even the CD has an important role, is understanding where the expertise lies, knowing who's particularly good at what area. So the scatter plot I put up there, the state should have that scatter plot in their head. And rather than come and say, we're going to tell you how to do this, we're going to tell you where a district's doing this really well, and we're going to help you uh, work together. Now for another. Well, and I, and I would say some of that attitude or approach, as Janelle said earlier, we, we've, we've kind of been trained uh, by the federal government and their accountability system in, in how, how going about, um, especially when it, when it connects to federal dollars, how we must intervene and how we must. Right. Um, it, it, and I would say that, um, uh, I mean, recently there are the, there been um, some good signs that, that ESEA may actually be reauthorized in my lifetime. Um, and, uh, and the latest proposals, there, you know, more flexibility given to states for, for um, accountability, which I, I don't think anyone would argue against. Um, and then I'll say one more word about the student engagement question, because it relates to some of the other type of, uh, of data that, that some refer to as fuzzy data, right? There's a concern that, well, gee, these are survey data or this is impression data given by the, by the teacher. I will say that, again, that's kind of, kind of old school thinking in terms of, of the API when it was, again, back when it was first created, right? There were some very high stakes um, uh, consequences, both good and bad, connected to it. And so there was a great reluctance to add anything to a system in which the difference of one or two students, as Jenny Singh is in the audience, she'll tell you, uh, a school's API just with, based on one or the change of one or two students could impact whether it met targets or not. And so there was a, there's this great reluctance because of the system that was created and high stakes tied to it to add anything to it that was anything but what was considered the most solid, valid, reliable, and consistent data across the state. If we're talking about a system that's multiple measures and no single indicator is going to be the difference by what one or two students, uh, how one or two students perform, then it kind of ratchets us down the, 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 the difference as to having to quantify um, the, the, the validity of each and every response um, if high stakes aren't tied to it. David, do you want to add on your sort of input process outcomes, the, the potential role in the systems approach for the state? I mean, one of the hardest things is for the state to somehow project some level of, of continuity um, in these processes. The thing you hear over and over and over again from educators is this too shall pass. And I mean, to the point where it's sort of like, uh, you know, kind of legendary in schools. And somehow, I think the kind of changes we're talking about here will, are going to create and cause and need changes in culture, in school culture. So this is not just procedural in nature. This is changing the way people do business. That's why I keep talking about systems improvement models. And I, I just don't, I mean, this is, you know, legislatures are elected every two years. So there's, no, there's no guarantee. That, that things won't change. But the more mechanisms you can put in place that give people some assurance that they're going to have the opportunity to work this through, I think that's a state level function that, that is absolutely a necessary prerequisite before you go down the road that we're talking about.
Yeah, it's a bit, it's a, it takes about six months to answer that question. <laughs> so, um, but the thing that occurs to me though, you know, to, to try to you know, answer that seriously is <clears throat> that the next step in the process I think really is laying out a kind of your conceptual framework and then doing what I would call an operational analysis and figuring out what really has to occur to move forward operationally, which is kind of what I think your question is. Uh, there's so many moving parts and pieces in all of this that you can spend all your time talking big ideas and big concepts and then fall down the very, uh, when you take the very first step operationally because some changes are going to, uh, you know, have turf issues for people. You know, if you've got somebody providing services for the improvement services, you know, who then impinges on somebody else who used to provide them, you know, if a new agency comes into being and it has new responsibilities, those, I mean, those are, that's one level of problem. You have other issues about data, and I know Linda's going to talk about a lot of this, so I, I, I think her response will probably uh, go a long way toward answering your question. But from my perspective, the, one of the next steps is really figuring out operationally what the, um, what the order of operations is here. And you, I think you ticked off a number of things, and thinking about how, you, how those are going to fit together and work is, is and what the implications are of, of uh, combining all of those is the next step. I'd like to point out we're using very good teacher wait time. I know, this is, <laughs> this is what I do, right? <laughs> no, I have no problem waiting till next time. But I do have other questions I will have to ask. So I'll, I'll push up Rick again on this. Since you've been doing this, you're actually engaged in doing this. Can you um, tell us a little bit, in particular, I'm, I'm really interested in how, um, not necessarily the agreement around the, the, the measures, the performance measures, and how metacognitive and all the, the extent to which you've expanded beyond just purely academic outcomes, but really how um, you got the district folks to be sitting to, to think about growth in particular, the conversations you had around sort of what's the, because this connects to Carrick's point around dashboards and where they're useful, and one of the places I would argue that they're useful is that you can sort of show people some realistic expectations for where growth might happen. And so I'm wondering if you, how the extent to the conversation you had around how to think about growth. Yeah, so I mean, th there's two things. I think that uh, we had a, um, you know, a, a basic growth model in API that was missing in AYP. And so I think in California, there was from the very beginning a feeling of this is something deeply missing in what we're looking at. And so it's something that people come to very quickly. And there was an immediate recognition with us, that, and you see it's a huge part of everything to do, is looking at that success. And I think there's this enormous frustration, especially with the, the AYP measure in particular, where it just sort of is that static bar. Is that we, no matter what you're doing, if you're not over it, it doesn't matter. And I think we, we started with a fundamental belief we had to sort of change that. We are just actually being in that work. So we're, we're literally developing a growth model, uh, just starting now, uh, using Smarter Balance, or we will be using Smarter Balance to judge um, both expected growth and then ultimate growth. And it is a very um, complicated and difficult question. It's, it, it's it, interesting enough is there's a lot of also conversation around non-tested subjects and grades where, and I'll talk about that in a second, but the reality is that the vast majority of teachers are in non-test subject grade, especially now if Smarter Balance, think about it, we're moving to simply an 11th grade exam. There's no growth mm -hmm. in high school uh, pegged to a uh, assessment. So looking at these, th these student learning outcomes, and actually it, it's incredibly time consuming and difficult, but this notion of teams of teachers, PLCs within a school sitting around and then, and then going at the district and collaborative level of saying what is a good learning objective, what, what should we expect um, we found uh, in our pilot process that people have found just the process very, very positive of sitting down and thinking what should we expect out of our students and then, um, and then having teams of teachers actually then hold themselves accountable towards that goal. And so we actually think there's a lot of power in that and a lot of potential in that, but I don't want to in any way underestimate the complexity and the, and, and the time difficulty of putting it together, but we're sort of in that process now. Yes, please. So that's a great question. Um, so the question was how we're using our accountability model to drive our LCAPs or vice versa, how it relates to our LCAPs. Um, 
And if, I mean, if you go back to our, you don't have to, but if you look at our accountability model, you'll find that the measures we're looking at, it, it's, it's pretty heck of a Venn diagram over the, uh, over the LCF app, right? There's a lot of measures that are very, very similar. We have a few that they don't, and there's a few that uh, the, the LCF has that we don't. But um, we are actually in the process of doing this. We actually have a graduate student from UC Berkeley who's deeply looking at all the LCAPs from our districts and uh, our accountability and trying to figure out where the tie is. So our, our goal is, as soon as this year, that we will have one document that we will use both as our as our school quality improvement system outcomes and as our um, as our LCAP. Um, and you know, I, I should tell you, I didn't talk about reporting on this, but if you look at our model, we, we are going to use. Um, actually, Linda showed us this uh, great report from Alberta um, that we're going to be used as a guide for uh, presenting our results. So uh, rather than simply say your score is this X number, we're actually going to look at how you're doing across all of your measures and then whether you're uh, whether you're growing, whether you're sort of stagnant, whether you're retreating. So you'll see across all the measures, basically within a one look, how you're doing. So that will be sort of something that we're going to, and we're actually working with great schools, we hope, to put it, to use their site because they have incredible reach. I, I don't know if you know, half of all parents, in, half of all the parents, at least in Los Angeles Unified, have viewed uh, uh, great schools at least once, which just blew me away. So there's a lot of people that are going there anyway. And so we're going to use them to sort of uh, highlight the work we've been doing. But then we, so we'll have sort of that dashboard, if you will, look at how we're doing across all these measures. And then the LCAP uh, would then sort of do a little more of a robust a conversation around what we're doing and how we're, trying to, how we're trying to deal with that. And we hope it to be a single document. Does that answer your question? Happy to talk about that right after now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I could say I, I think this is not an either or, and so it, I, I think this is not a case where we either push for status or we push for growth. I think part of this is how do we develop a system that that encourages and or even supports both. Um, and, and I think this is the case as we look at what should be in the local domain as to what should be in the state domain. Um, and, and if you look at the structure of what has emerged within LCFF and LCAPS, we've said this is, we have eight state priorities, and, and these are the standard areas or the areas that we, we want to see some attention or should be priorities, but then locally determine your goals and your outcomes. So how do we reconcile that in that, I think as Rick pointed out, there's overlap between what districts like CORE are, are thinking about and those eight state priorities in terms of the metrics. Um, and you know, I think this is the space where, you know, as David said earlier, we could, we could spend uh, the next six months just figuring this out, and we will. And that is, we are going to have to figure out how do we have a system that sets forth some sense of what it looks like at the state level, and we can aggregate to and be talking about, but also preserve and honor the local decision making and conversation. So I think it's a, a system that both lifts and pulls and tugs and, and shuffles. Um, and that's not something we've really done, although I think we get close when you look at uh, what's emerging in the core district. So. Yeah, and then I'd add, and I'll give it to Carrick. No. Uh, is that, um, so two things. One is that I, I actually think uh, um, publicly reporting data, so actually putting information out there, being transparent, matters a lot. So core talked about, uh, core, Carrick talked about IUSP. And it was the single, that and HP were the single things that actually had consequences to API, right? So when they went away, technically, the API had no consequence, which say it wouldn't change what you did at a school based on your score. But uh, as all of you remember the um, eighth grade algebra conversation we had, there was a time in California when we gave what was called the gifted 200, right? You got 200 points in the API if you moved your eighth graders from, if you moved your uh, kids in eighth grade into algebra. And when we 
offered that gift of 200, we went from about 35% of the kids in eighth grade in algebra to about 50% of the kids. Now, there was no consequences. It didn't matter. Your API number, which we were publicly reported, went down. And my point was that is that just simply putting it out there caused people to react. And so I do think there's a role for just having that information out there, and it will have impact. But the next thing I actually would say was that um, I, I think one of the things that's particularly powerful about the core model from, from the district's perspective is that it is voluntary. It is, it is their choice. They're not being forced to do this. This is what, and if you look at the fact that we did an end size of 200, uh, of 20, that we chose to do an eighth grade metric, we chose to make it as robust as possible, that was not mandated. That was districts choosing to get a high level accountability because it was the work that they wanted to do. And ultimately, the key is it was non putative It wasn't you forcing me to make changes. This is what we think matters for kids, and we're going to hold ourselves accountable. And I think if you create a, um, a model where that's the culture, I actually think you'll have more success than if you tried to mandate it from the beginning. Take a quick, take a quick shot, and then if you want to jump in, let me know. So I remember the theory of action on the current model, which is a particular federal one, which is that all students are going to meet uh, AYP by 2014, which just, oops, we missed it by about three weeks, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but the, they, that was a way to get around a political problem, which was to say, uh, you know, could you have winners and losers? Well, we're going to solve that by saying everybody's going to do it. Well, the reality of how social systems work is you're going to have some that do better and some that do worse. If you have a system like this, what you can do is, like we're talking about multiple measures, maybe a spine of state indicators. Uh, you know, what are the odds that a school is going to do, you, you know, extremely well on the state indicators and do extremely poorly and set very low standards on the local ones? Maybe. So a few might do it. But what you're more likely to have is people who are doing poorly on the state indicators all picking very unchallenging goals locally because that reflects an unhealthy culture in a school, in an organization. So you know, if you just go at this kind of organizational theory, you're probably better off <clears throat> having some kind of a mechanism where you're watching for the, those outliers that Rick had in his chart as opposed to applying it to everybody in a way that it won't, it won't have much effect on most of the people by, you know, setting a, an unrealistic standard for everyone and then holding everyone went to it. Instead, uh, you use a set of targeted, in, you know, you have a set of targeted indicators that you're watching that are like, it's sort of like, uh, you know, vital signs in a, in, a, in a human. You know, you go into a doctor and they check, they start by checking your vital signs, but they don't stop there. Then they, you know, you as an individual have particular issues that you're concerned about. So I think we can, we can have a vital signs measure and then start getting more sophisticated about looking at organizational health because the vast majority of schools that are having problems have organizational health problems. It's not as if you've got a fantastic principal and fantastic staff running all these great programs and the kids just aren't learning. It's you've got dysfunctional, a whole lot of dysfunction with the adults and a whole lot of dysfunction with the way the system's operating as a prerequisite for, for most of the problems most of the time. So I think we start with a model that uncovers that for us and then we deal with it as an organizational problem, not as a punishment because, you know, you're bad. It's, it's you know, we, we come in and try to fix it. So just to, just to, to clarify, 100% we, we, of the students actually were proficient, but we did away with the CST, so we didn't have the data to demonstrate it. We know it to be true. <laughs> so, so the undercurrent, though, to, to, to your question, uh, Robert, is, is the unasked question, I should say, is, is it the role of the state to set a target for schools and districts and the state as a whole? Um, of course, we, you know, under API, we, we, we set a state goal of 800 for all schools. Then we told schools what their target was that they had to meet, and then we told them whether they met it or not. And the real question is, is that the system we want to continue uh, to produce? And I, and I think that's, uh, um, I think there's a real question about whether we want to produce a system that does that. that because the issue is not I don't think the issue is that we want the state to say thumbs up or thumbs down as to whether you made a target. I think the real, the real question we want people to ask themselves is whether we made the target or didn't make the target, what do we think about that locally, right? We made our target. Well, was our target high enough? Or that was really good progress. We should keep doing what we're doing or you know, we met the target, but we really should have had more growth, and maybe we need to, to adjust our target that way. Not so much for the purpose of making a decision or a judgment on whether the target was met, 
but what are we going to do about whether we made the target or not, which is this idea, again, of continuous improvement. Okay. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists. Mm -hmm.